Mies van der Rohe, on the other hand, is almost diametrically opposed to Frank Lloyd Wright, the subject of our discussion last Tuesday. As you could see, Frank Lloyd Wright was an excessive man, leading an operatic life. Despite his small stature, he was expansive and warm, capable of fostering an empathy that led approximately 200 out of the 500 homeowners for whom he built houses to write books about their experiences. This indicates his charismatic nature as his clients felt compelled to document their relationships with him. Indeed, Wright left behind a complete works spanning over 1,000 pages across three volumes, along with 12,000 drawings and 100,000 letters. So, his archives are inexhaustible, much like the man himself was inexhaustible. In contrast, Mies van der Rohe, who was 20 years younger and German, as you almost certainly know, was a large, corpulent man, taciturn, hardly saying anything, barely writing, seldom giving interviews. His thoughts, we've reconstructed them through the study of his library, the books he read, the marks he left in those books. He prided himself, as you know, on his motto, less is more, expressing and communicating very little. His life was much more mundane than Frank Lloyd Wright's, I must tell you. Here, there won't be mass murders or great fires, except for the great fire that devastated Europe. During the 1930s, with the rise of Nazism, which indeed profoundly transformed Mies van der Rohe's life, he was forced into exile to America, to Chicago, where Frank Lloyd Wright had lived. This is where he would spend the second part of his career. So here, we will talk about two Mies, the German Mies and the American Mies, with that intermediate rupture, the exile, which fundamentally altered his trajectory. These two personas were also different in other aspects. For example, as we discussed in the videos about Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright had a rather lax attitude towards technique and function, whereas me is... Very few of you may have used them because they are no longer marketed. They were supremely uncomfortable. His buildings were not easy to use. In the other series of videos, I compared horizontal buildings with the Guggenheim in New York, talking about these bands that have served as a logo for both the Guggenheim and many other buildings. However, I didn't tell you that any other auditorium is much more comfortable than the Guggenheim Museum in New York. I haven't had the opportunity to give a lecture there, but it is the most hostile place for anyone addressing an audience, not to mention the leaks. It was famous for its leaks. Sometimes clients would despair, while others would resign themselves, saying, your house has leaks, to which the response would be, well, that's what happens when you leave a work of art out in the rain. Mies was very different. Mies had that rigorous obsession with function, with technique. Very few of you may have used them because they are no longer marketed. They were supremely uncomfortable. His buildings were not easy to use. In the other series of videos, I compared horizontal buildings with the Guggenheim in New York, talking about these bands that have served as a logo for both the Guggenheim and many other buildings. However, I didn't tell you that any other auditorium is much more comfortable than the Guggenheim Museum in New York. I haven't had the opportunity to give a lecture there, but it is the most hostile place for anyone addressing an audience, not to mention the leaks. It was famous for its leaks. Sometimes clients would despair, while others would resign themselves, saying, your house has leaks, to which the response would be, well, that's what happens when you leave a work of art out in the rain. Mies was very different. Mies had that rigorous obsession with function, with technique. His auditoriums are extraordinary. I don't know any better than the two or three of Mises that I've had the opportunity to visit. The difference between them, borrowing a bit from the image used by Isaiah Berlin, is like the fox and the hedgehog. Frank Lloyd Wright, the fox, knows a lot about many things, scattered and torrential, while Mies, the hedgehog, only knows one thing and pursues it relentlessly and tirelessly. 
One of his favorite phrases was, we don't have to invent a new architecture every morning, and indeed he tirelessly pursued the same architecture throughout his life. An architecture he wanted to be a synthesis of tradition and modernity. Today he's seen as the quintessential modernist, yet he was rooted in continuity with the classical world. As I've mentioned in the other videos and reiterate today, architects think with images, so our conversation will also be with images. The first image is the one you already have on the screen, depicting the young Mies in front of his first house in Berlin. For a client who would be something more than just a client, Alois Riel, a scholarly professor, a reader of Nietzsche, and an advocate of a sort of neo-Kantian realism that sought to reconcile tradition and modernity, was the one whom this young man from Aachen, much like Wright had done 20 years earlier when he left his birthplace to go to Chicago where things were happening, sought to work with the most important figures, eventually with Sullivan. Similarly, Mies went to Berlin from Aachen, which you know is in the Rhineland region, at the corner of three countries where Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium meet. He went to Berlin at the age of 19 because that's where things were happening. He didn't have much formal education. He was the son of a family of stonemasons and carvers of tombstones. He had learned how to carve tombstones from his father and had, uh, he didn't have much formal education. He was the son of a family of stonemasons and carvers of tombstones. He had learned how to carve tombstones from his father and had a very good training in drawing. He was well acquainted with materials, but his intellectual education was very limited. However, with Alois Riel, the scholar for whom he built the house, his life changed. Suddenly, his mind was furnished with a world that was foreign to his childhood and early adolescence. In that house, colloquially called Klosterly or the Little Cloister, they held periodic gatherings, salons where the most interesting people of the time congregated. And this young newcomer from Aachen, thanks to his involvement in these gatherings, acquired a refinement that allowed him to be seen posing proudly in a well-tailored suit in front of the soberly classical facade of his first house. He had first been working with Bruno Paul, an architect of the Biedermeier style, critical of the Baroque tendencies of Wilhelmine Germany, who created classical architecture but refined without grand gestures, stripped of details. This influence of Bruno Paul is present in this first house that he built for Alois Riel, where we see a kind of subdued monumentality, which is somewhat unusual for such a small house. With this retaining wall of earth extending into the landscape, giving it a uniqueness that will later remind us of Mises' subsequent works. When we get to those later works, I will remind you to recall this image. But shortly after working with Bruno Paul, he entered the prominent office in Berlin, that of Peter Behrens. Similarly to Wright entering Sullivan's office, Mies learned almost everything from Behrens. Of course, when Mies was in Behrens' office, Behrens' own work was already being influenced by the ideas of this young apprentice who had no formal education. He hadn't attended a university or a school, nor did he have the training in arts and crafts that he brought with him. Moreover, he absorbed ideas from the discussions in the little cloister. Notice the similarity between this crematorium by Behrens and the house we just saw. In Behrens' studio, there were two branches, one for architects more focused on technique, designing factories and functional buildings, and another for the more artistic architects such as Mies van der Rohe, who were involved in designing houses and the monumental aspects of the office. So, while in Behrens' office, Mies designed this house. He also worked on this significant project, the Monument to Bismarck, which was never realized but was important in Mies's life. Here, he began to familiarize himself with something that would be present throughout his life, the desire to create modern architecture rooted in tradition. 
In the Prussian classicism of Schinkel, with which Mies van der Rohe shares so many similarities, this image depicts the project for the monument to Bismarck, which was never realized, and it echoes the works of Schinkel from the same period. And you can see how this form of bare classicism interacts with the topography. So, it has some references to a work from a hundred years earlier by Schinkel himself. Thus, he aimed to create modern architecture rooted in convention. And his big opportunity came with this house, which was more than just a house. It was a palace, as you can see, for an immensely powerful family from the Netherlands, the Kroeler Millers, art collectors who originally asked Behrens, the leading architect of the time, to design their house. However, the task fell into Mises' hands because he was in charge of residential commissions at the studio. He proposed a house, which you can see here in two different representations, first in this exquisite watercolor and then in the lower image, which is a one, one-scale model. They constructed it with wood and canvas on site to test its functionality. The Kroeler Millers were important clients, but at the same time difficult. Mrs. Kroeler Miller was indecisive and always sought the opinions of many, struggling to make a decision. However, she was clear that she didn't like the initial project Mies had created under Baron's supervision. Yet, this young man, who visited their office in Berlin to discuss matters in Holland, was increasingly drawn to Mies's ideas. So, he began to suggest to Mies the idea of leaving Barons's studio, and he designed the villa. Barons also began to suspect that this young man was going to take away his commission, which eventually happened in 1912. Mies had to leave Barons' office, but with a commission in hand, which was the Kroeler Müller Villa. This project had initially been started under the auspices of his mentor, but it allowed him to establish his independent practice. However, he never got to build it. Mrs. Kroeler Müller, as indecisive as ever, attributed it to another architect, a Dutchman named Berlage. But did Berlage build it? No, he didn't either, as he changed his mind. Ultimately, it was constructed by a Belgian architect named Van de Velde, all names we've mentioned in the Reich Conference because they were present in the milieu of that time, in the renewal of avant-garde in Europe. But for me, this project was very important, extremely important. You can see it here, for example, in this image, a sort of aerial view of the model he made. It bears a certain resemblance to the house he designed for himself at the time, where there's a series of pieces that blend with the landscape, rectangles juxtaposed, a kind of stripped-down classicism devoid of adornments. Of course, when we talk about that office where Mies was working, alongside him was Gropius, his alter ego, his friend enemy, with whom he would continue to contend throughout his life. Also in Baron's office during those years before the First World War was Le Corbusier. The most important architects of the 20th century passed through Baron's studio. As I mentioned earlier, Gropius was focused on factories. Gropius, who had written books about factories, drew inspiration from America, particularly from the factories being built there at the time, such as those by Albert Kahn. He tried to merge this fascination with America with what they were striving to express in Germany at the time. He said, The Albercon factories are extraordinary, but their style is archaic, outdated. His mentor, Behrens, had designed the AEG turbine factory around the same time as the Ford factory. The turbine factory is extraordinary, isn't it? With that monumentality that resembles a classical temple. Of course, Behrens was a better architect than Albert Kahn and could express this new condition of the industry with different tools, with different instruments. I bring up this comparison because Gropius would later design many factories. He would make the Fagus factory very famous, where glass and metal became the driving elements of everything. And in the Berlin Pavilion in Cologne, where the new architecture was beginning to take shape, well, this Gropius and this Mies, 
who shared a seat in Barron's office, would later have an extraordinarily interesting trajectory that we will see later on. They looked at each other askance. Mies despised Gropius because Gropius couldn't draw well and lacked artistic talent. However, Gropius, who came from aristocratic lineage, saw Mies as a provincial man, uncultured and excessively classicist. He couldn't understand that the new architecture had to embrace industrial imagery and have the appearance of a machine. Mies, however, he was so enamored with the project he had done for the Kroiler Müller family that seven years later, when an exhibition of independent artists was organized with Gropius as the curator, and they asked him to present a project for display, he gave them the Kroiler Müller Villa. Gropius, indignant, said, but how can I exhibit this alongside the others? This isn't a modern project. It's not in line with what we're seeking. Mies had a different path, one of reconciling mechanical modernity with the classical tradition ingrained in his training in arts and crafts and his fascination with another architect, the Dutchman Berlage, who also disregarded any modernity not based on construction. In summary, we've delved into the fascinating intersection of Mies van der Rohe, his era, and his architectural counterparts like Gropius. How did they define and challenge each other in the crucible of 20th century architectural avant-garde? Find out in our next episode, where we'll further explore the divergent paths of these two giants of modern architecture. Don't miss it. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the architectural world of Mies van der Rohe and his contemporaries. Stay tuned for more insightful explorations in our next episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. Until next time, keep exploring, keep creating, and keep dreaming. Goodbye for now.